put our hands together. Now you might feel like flying away, but why don't you have a seat? And um, we want to welcome you this morning. We're so glad that you're here and a part of this worship experience. I trust that this will be one of the best hours of your week and that it will prepare you for what God has in store for you in the week to come. While we're here, there are those that are joining us online, and we want to welcome our online guests as well. And particularly want to welcome um, back Pastor Terry and Becky. Let's give them a good round of applause. Good to see our pastor back. Brad Blystone has an update on the crisis care kits that uh, he talked about last week and see where we're at on all of that. So Brad's going to come and stand on the platform there and give us a good report. I tried to give him, get him to give me one of those little deals I wore in your collar, but they wouldn't give it to me. I just wanted to um, update you a little bit. Last week I made a plea to um, fill some crisis care kits. If you don't know what those are, the, the Church of Nazarene has what they call a, a, a Nazarene Compassionate Ministry. And uh, they put together a lot of different deals and they have people that go uh, throughout the, the world, literally, uh, helping in crisis situations. And we had an opportunity last week to put together some care kits, and uh, we had the teens pass out about 350 Ziploc bags. And uh, I just want to report to you that um, we, we raised last Sunday about $2,500. And uh, yeah, that's, that is, that's an awesome figure. Uh, Sunday afternoon, we had what I, I'm going to call our super shoppers. We, 
uh, ladies went out and we, we gathered up supplies for about 200 bags on faith because we didn't know that money had come in. And um, we were going to put, put together about 200 bags last Sunday while we were doing the cookout, and we ended up putting together 258. And then we were able to count the money, and we went out and purchased more supplies. Uh, the average cost for putting a bag together is about $12. It seems to be the, the number that I've heard thrown around. And our ladies, I don't know how they did it, but they, uh, they got it done it for about nine dollars a bag which was really unbelievable uh, this week I had a friend of mine donate about 400 beanie bags uh, a little bit late for our shipment last week uh, we got all those bags together and boxed them up in about 63 boxes and uh, I took them to North Oklahoma City to put in a big trailer and they went to Tishomingo to be in a bigger trailer and further on down uh, to serve a need down there in Florida um, the one thing I want to talk to you about right now is, is this was kind of a reaction to a need. Uh, it's probably better to be proactive to, to needs that you know are coming. So we're going to try to set up a program where we can do crisis care kits throughout the year. And um, I'm gonna, we'll talk about that more tonight at the Work and Witness group. Um, there's also a group of people that uh, I think Cindy Nikolai is trying to put together to go down to Florida or go down to Texas and do some disaster relief. They, I went down to Houston Friday and uh, made just a one-day trip and um, we went down to Pasadena and carried a trailer load of supplies down there. They have, still have a huge need. Uh, you couldn't tell it. The city was kind of up and running again, but I heard a lot of stories of people coming in that uh, you know they lost their house totally or they're gutting their house completely and and a lot of people misplaced and and that's what we want to do is, is try to serve those needs we're pretty fortunate here not to have flood damages uh, we do have our share of disaster with tornadoes but I just wanted to thank everybody for doing that the the other thing the the kids I forgot, the kids put together uh, 42 bags this week. So that, uh, that put us well over 400 bags that, that our little, little church here put together for disaster relief. And I just want to thank everybody. Um, it is going to be an ongoing o effort. So um, I think we, the bags that we passed out last week, I think it was around 320 in that neighborhood. We received about... Um, 120 back, 150 back. So there's still, you know, 150 bags out there someplace. So if you um, if you feel the need to to finish a bag off, just go ahead and do that and turn it into the office or turn it um, turn it into Fred. Fred and Nikolai will take them. So Steve Ruby will take them. So I just, thank you for the time, Steve. Uh, appreciate it and appreciate all your help. Thank you, Brad, and uh, thank you. I I was uh, excited as uh, last week uh, we did. I I was able to sneak in on the uh, service. Uh, we went to church with Becky's dad, but after that was over, I was able to watch a little bit and was excited to hear what you guys were doing to help those in need. Well, this morning as uh, we have the opportunity to participate in another baby dedication, and so I'd like to ask uh, Luke, uh, Luke to come forward. Luke, come on down here. Uh, Abby, bring uh, and Nathan come and your family. And uh, we have this opportunity to share in this very special time. Get them all situated. This act of dedication today is a, a, a great choice that you have made as parents of Luke to present him back to the, to the Lord who gave him to you as a precious gift. 
The act of dedication has its roots in the story of the presentation of Samuel by Elkanah and Hannah and of Jesus by Joseph and Mary. And then Paul reminds young Timothy that from a child he had known the sacred scriptures. Jesus considered the little ones infinitely precious and he said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. This morning, I just want to share there's three foundational truths that I want to emphasize as we begin this dedication. Number one, children are precious to God. Their lives are sacred because He has been created in the image of our God, and He has the capacity to personally relate to the Lord. Number two, in spite of the innocent beauty of this child, we recognize that we are all sinners and that none of us can earn our salvation. And when Luke comes of age, he will need to confess his sins and receive the gift of salvation. And number three, dedication declares that Jesus is the rescuer. Scripture says there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, in the New Living Translation, we read, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up and when you sing those songs. Oh, no, that's not in there, but I know that you already had a mic for him before he was born even. But this is the commandment of God, that we should diligently raise our children in his most holy faith. And so in, in obedience to this command, Nathan and Abby, you come here today and stand before us to present Luke back to the Lord. You have already noticed how much Luke has learned these first four months in his life. And you know his learning capacity will continue to escalate. And it, and it will be at a rapid speed these next few years. And you have the opportunity to help establish his course. Part of your commitment here today is the commitment that not only signifies your faith in, Christ, your faith in, in God, but also your desire that Luke may know and follow the will of God. That he may live and die as a Christ follower. Not just receiving the gift of eternal life, that is important and we believe wholeheartedly in that, but also entering into a relationship with God that guides and sustains and empowers him to live this life. You guys have the responsibility to teach him to fear the Lord, to watch over his education, doing your best to see that he is not led down a broad path of destruction but instead finds the narrow path which leads to life. You will teach him by word and example the importance of belonging, belonging to and participating in the body of Christ, to guard his relationships and his friends, helping him to not only discern the difference between right and wrong, but also to find the value of building relationships with individuals who can serve as an encouragement to his faith and not a detriment. With God's help, will you do your best to be the kind of parents God intends you to be? If so, answer, we will. We will. Well, in our flower arrangement behind me, we see that Luke is symbolized or represented by the white rosebud in the arrangement. He is pure before Christ and has all the potential in the world to bloom and to become what God wants him to be. Each of you will have the opportunity to help him become all that Christ intends and created him to be. Nathan, the bouquet contains a red rose and it represents you. The color red is significant in our Christian faith. It is often used to represent the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to take on our sins and to make atonement or pay the, the price for our sins. We are thankful today that Christ has paid the price for our sins, and we don't need to do that. But as a father, specifically, 
you will have the opportunity to sacrifice for Luke, making whatever sacrifice is necessary for him to know Christ. Will you teach him about God's love and will you do your best with his help to guide Luke to a Christ-like faith? If so, answer, I will. will. Abby, the yellow rose signifies the softness and the tenderness of a mother's love. You will have the opportunity, and you already have, to love on this little guy, to hold him and to squeeze him and discover again and again the joy of motherhood. Will you commit today to Luke to Nathan, to your family, and most importantly to God, that you will do your best not only to love him and teach him about faith and life, but that you will serve as a model to him of what a Christian lady, a Christian mom, and a Christian wife should look like. Will you teach him about God's love, and will you do your best with God's help to guide him in a Christ-like faith? If so, answer, I will. I will. Family, what a joy it is to have you join with us today to travel and be part of our, our church family. And I just have to say as pastor, thanks for allowing them to uh, leave their home and leave uh, the comforts of, of Hutchison and that area to come and to minister to us here in Mustang. But you too will have the opportunity to show support and to show your love for this precious child I know that Nathan and Abby already know of your love for them and for Luke. But I'm asking today as part of this dedication, will you declare publicly your love and support for this couple and your desire to do your best to not only love Luke, but also to show him the love of Jesus and the path to godly living? If so, answer, I will. And finally, congregation, you too play an important part in this child's life and in every child in our congregation. And truthfully, we play a part in every child in the midst of our world, our circle. Will you, congregation, commit to support this young couple by praying for them, and will you serve as a model of godly influence before Luke and all of our kids? If so, answer, we will. It's a great sound of the church family. Luke? You've been watching me. Let's see how you do. Let's bow our heads and let's pray a prayer of dedication. Luke James Kiever, today we dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we thank you for this precious life. We know that he is loved supremely by parents. And we thank you for their act today to say we want to present him to you, Lord. But we know ultimately you have the greatest love for him, that you have sent your son to die so that he might live. And that same thing for all of us. And so today as we pray, as we commit uh, this child back into your hands, we pray that you will be with him as he grows, that you will place your hand upon his life, and that you will use him in a very special way in the days ahead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You did good. (laughs) And here is the certificate of dedication and the flowers that we hope that you will remember uh, this day for. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for being a part. I invite you to uh, stand once again as we continue to worship, declaring that no matter what is going on in this world, we can face it because we know he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn.
but all declaring together that our God reigns and that our God will be praised. Let's continue to sing out praise to his name.
Father, this morning we declare that you reign. You reign over the storms of life, over the battles that we face, over the situations that mount. You're the God that reigns. And we praise your name this morning. We give you honor. We thank you for how you, how you demonstrate your love to us day by day. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that woke us up this morning. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for how you're moving in our lives. Thank you for what you're at work doing even now in those situations that may challenge us. We're thankful, God, that there's no situation that's too big for our God. We're glad you're our hope and our help, our strength and our refuge. We're thankful this morning that we can gather in a place like this and lift our praise to a God who's worthy. Oh God, I pray you'll take delight in what it is we offer to you as an act of our sacrificial worship. Father, we're thankful that you know us. You know us so well. Your word says that you know our thoughts from afar. You know when we rise up and when we lie down know when we go out and when we come in. We're thankful that we're never outside the scope of your care. Though there's times when we may feel like we've been abandoned, but your word says that never will you leave us and never will you forsake us. We're thankful, God, that you reign over life and over death. You're the God that knows how to bring comfort to grieving hearts. The God that knows how to heal sick bodies. The God that knows how to restore broken relationships. The God that knows how to redeem lost souls. Father, we pray today that you'll do your work in this place among your people. We've come because we're hungry to meet with you. 
We're hungry to know you. And I pray that you'll take authority in this place over every lie, over every situation. We commit them to you. We surrender them to you. And we affirm that we are your people, determined with all that there is in us to live our lives for you, to please you, to represent you well to a world that needs to see Jesus. And I pray, God, that to that end, you will help us to be better prepared and equipped to be ambassadors for you in a fallen world when we leave this place this morning. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen.
Um, at this time, our ushers are preparing uh, as we um, get ready to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Even our giving is an act of our worship and trust that as we worship together and as we generously return to God um, what is His, that uh, God will bless that and multiply it so that the needs of, uh, of our world can be met through the church. Let's pray. Great Father in heaven, we come to you today in prayer. We are so honored just to be able to stand in your presence and worship your name freely. In this privilege alone, we are blessed above most people. Lord, we come to you and we bring our gifts. We owe you so much, and what we bring to you is so small, but we know that through your infinite power, you can multiply it and touch those who are hurting, who are in need today. Through all of the troubles that this world faces, the natural disasters, there are so many who need to hear your voice and seek your presence today. We pray that you will do this for us and use these gifts to further your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
appreciate the choir and their ministry to us. Uh, the choir obviously is up and running again, and if you have an interest uh, in the choir, you might speak with Pastor Nathan. I'm sure he'd love to have some additional voices join with these um, this morning. Our children at this time are going to be dismissed to go upstairs with Pastor Kim. You may be here for the first time and have children uh, that are elementary age. If you'd like uh, them to go up there uh, and be a part of that worship experience, we'd encourage you to follow them up so that you'll know where to pick them up at the close of the service this morning. Tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, we will meet across the lobby uh, in Hunter Hall or the gymnasium for a work and witness cafe. Tonight's menu is Mexican, and we would um, invite you to join with us. The suggested donation is $5 for adults and $3 for children. I think there is a $15 family limit, so um, that's a pretty good deal. It beats going somewhere else uh, and this is a good way for us to support the work of missions. So, Pastor Terry is going to come and bring us the message. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, each of you, for being here this morning. I've enjoyed uh, honoring our Lord and uh, listening to your voices uh, offer up praise. Uh, as I stand before you today, I, I just need to take a moment to express... Uh, on behalf of Becky and myself, our appreciation for your support, uh, your many words of kindness and uh, actions of encouragement to, during this dif difficult time. Uh, Becky's mother, uh, she would often call me and, and uh, she would say, Hi Terry, this is Mom Ruth. And uh, so that's the way that she many times would refer to me. And... Uh, as we have been together with the family, we have discovered that, um, you know, the last year, year and a half, she has struggled uh, with life. Um, and, the, as, and we kind of knew this, but we really came to know it. Uh, the real heart of the matter was a matter of her heart. Um, her... Her aortic valve had stopped working. It was diseased, and, and so it wouldn't allow it to, to work very well. And so for this past, uh, particularly the past year, there would be these times in her, in her life that she just felt as if she was suffocating because she, she couldn't get air because the valve wasn't working. And uh, as they talked to the doctor and the surgeons, uh, the doctor was pretty confident uh, that uh, they would be able to do the surgery and, and give Mom Ruth uh, some quality of life and that she would just be able to enjoy all the things that she enjoyed. Let there be light, huh? Um, there it comes. One of the things that we probably say, uh, going back to uh, Brett's Sunday school class today, uh, the, the devil's in that board is probably one of the untruths that uh, we uh, talk about. But uh, we're just, pay, just focus here. Even, no matter what the lights do tonight, today, it's all right. Uh, it's going to grab our attention. Um, you know, one of the things, this, this surgeon, we sat Thursday night, and, and uh, when we drove here, left here almost two weeks ago, you know, we just didn't anticipate what we would face over the next uh, few days and weeks since then. But the, the doctors just felt real, really strongly that uh, the surgery, surgery, uh, surgery, uh, surgery was a low-risk surgery. And... Uh, but the risk was much greater than anticipated. And, and there was more to the matter of the heart than they thought. And, and as I've tried to prepare my heart for, for this message this morning, and, and, and let me just backtrack for a moment. Uh, it was an extreme honor for me to be able to, to speak and to, to preach the message at uh, Mom Ruth's service and uh, to, to honor her and to lift up her God in a way that uh, 
reflected her heart. Uh, not her physical heart, but her spiritual heart. And uh, as I've thought about her these last few weeks, and, and I know Pastor Steve uh, preached the last two Sundays on Jonah, and so I've been reading Jonah, and I just want to kind of end uh, the Jonah passages today um, with this idea that the heart of the matter is really a matter of the heart. As we have looked through uh, the book of Jonah, and it's a relatively sh short book, uh, we, we discover some selfishness of Jonah. I don't want to go there, God. I, I really don't want to do the thing that you have asked me to do. And, and so I've been continually reminded that, that all of us, there's this incredible message in this book that speaks of the selfishness of human nature. And, and that, that if God asks us to do something that, we, that doesn't really align with, with what we think we want to do, we tend to run away from that. And so this selfishness, this self-centeredness, this desire to do our own thing in our own way according to our own desire and our own timing. And, and I think that, that Jonah reminds us that, that this kind of disobedience to God is sin, period. And sin separates us from God. And if it's left alone, it will cause us to die a spiritual death and to be eternally separated from God in darkness and chaos. Friends, today this passage reminds me, the book of Jonah reminds me, hell is for real. Eternal separation from God is truly a, a truth that is taught to us in the Word of God. I like the story of Jonah because it tells of the great truth of the character of God. And, and we call this, this one attribute of God prevenient grace. Grace that is at work in our lives before we discover that God is at work in our lives. As we read the story of Jonah, we see that God was at work in the midst of a storm. And God provided for Jonah by, by giving a large fish to swallow him up. The Lord was at work to redeem and to restore Jonah. And my friends, Jonah teaches us this truth that his prevenient grace is at work in our lives No matter how far we have run, no matter how sinful we have been, my friends, the love of God reaches out to us before we ever ask, before we even know that we need His love, His forgiveness. He reaches out to us with His unconditional love. God's prevenient grace is already at work, providing a way, making a provision for us to discover His love for us. My friends, that is good news today. His love, His mercy is at work in each of our lives, making us aware. We also see how God is able to use the circumstances around us to bring about his change and His will into the midst of His world. Scripture tells us that God so loved each and every one of us that He provided a way of salvation so that everyone, every one of us, might experience His unconditional love and the hope and the promise of eternal life. As we look at this passage and look at the book, we see these sailors that are, that are guiding the ship towards Tarshish. Uh, most commentators refer to these sailors as pagans. They each had their own god. They, they worshipped other gods, other idols. And in the midst of this storm, we read in that passage that they were crying out to their gods but their God was not doing anything to help them. And finally, the, 
the captain of the ship went down below. And, and don't you just wonder how in the world, with the guilt that, that Jonah was feeling, had to be feeling, from running from God, he could be asleep in the midst of this storm? But here he is asleep, and he come, and the captain wakes him up, and he comes on, on to the deck of the ship. And, and he, he simply preaches this little message to these sailors, these pagan sailors. He says in chapter 1, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and, in dry, and dry land. That was his message to these sailors. He, he just simply told him about the God he served. You see, somehow, sometimes it seems as if we Christians develop this idea that we can't share our love for God because we don't have the right words to say. And, and we think that our, our testimony, our message has to be written out in, in all the right words, with all the right vernaculars, with all the right capitalizations and all the, the right punctuation. But the reality is we simply have to tell them who we serve. It doesn't have to be in a way that, that is proper. It has to be in a way that's for real. This morning as we were praying, I, I just thought about this idea of living out loud. Uh, a friend of ours has been involved in a CrossFit uh, and open, uh, involved in opening a new store up in Edmond, and it's, it's called Loud City, something like that. And uh, I just thought about loud, this idea of loud. And I, I just began to think, okay, I want to live out loud. I, I want people to be able to see me and look at me and watch me and be able to tell that there is something significantly different. And, and I think that Jonah, as he proclaimed, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, and, and I wondered how he could even say that, to be real honest. How could he even say that he was a worshiper of the Lord when he was disobeying what God had asked him to do? But that was the message that he proclaimed. And in chapter 1, verse 14, we see that these pagan so, uh, sailors cry out to the one and true God when they say, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. And when they threw Jonah overboard and the raging sea grew calm, it says the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to Him. If somehow you and I could learn to live out loud our praise to the Creator, we can trust that God will bring change and transformation into the lives of the people around us. I want to challenge you to make a decision this morning that we are not going to be cry out to God in desperation. You see, as I look at Jonah's life, one of the things that I, I kind of wonder about is this fact that, that Jonah gets into this desperate belly of the great fish before he really cries out to the Lord. And I think of how we, the people of God, often wait until we're in desperate situations to cry out to God. And so I challenge me, all of us this morning, let's, let's communicate with our Creator on a daily basis. And, and let's discover His presence and His peace not just when we're in dire straits. But I love that God causes the fish to vomit Jonah onto dry ground. And here God calls again to Jonah. And so as we read this story, we see that God is a God of second chances. So no matter what you have done in the past, God still wants to call you and give you a second chance to be obedient. And then we, we also discover in Jonah that this is a great missionary book. I, I liked how Steve uh, shared with us 
and challenged us from the idea that to get in perspective what Jonah was going through would be as if we were called to go speak to an ISIS convention and tell them to repent or they would be destroyed. And Jonah was being called to go to the Ninevites, the enemy. And he was called to give this message of repentance and condemnation, judgment. And God longs to see all of creation redeemed and restored. And so this passage calls us to be a missionary people, missionary minded. So there's a lot of messages that that's in this passage, but as I read through it, I got I just struggled with chapter four. Because I think chapter four is really about the the heart of the, the matter of the heart. I'm going to read it to you, Jonah chapter 4. I'd like for you to listen. This is a dialogue that simply takes place between God and Jonah. Jonah's ticked off. He's upset. He's frustrated because the God of second chances has relented. His, his word, his command to, that the Ninevites would be destroyed and, and God is not going to destroy the Ninevites because they had repented. And Jonah is just upset. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish? I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down under at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Do you get this picture going on? Jonah has gone into Nineveh in chapter 3, and he simply said, you guys are just going to be destroyed. He didn't say anything about God. He didn't say anything about a, a message of forgiveness. He didn't give any hope for these people. He just simply said, you're going to be destroyed. That was his message. And as you read in chapter 3, the, the people, the king, they repented. They, they put on the sackcloth and ashes as a symbol of humility, recognizing that God was greater and they repented of their sins. Even the cows, it says, changed. I don't know how that happens. And so Jonah's up on the hill and he's just waiting to watch God destroy the city, and he's upset because God hadn't done it. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. The, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I am so angry I wish I were dead. 
But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, although you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So what is the heart of the matter here? The real matter of the heart was Jonah's condition. A prophet of God. Disobeyed God, went and did his own thing. God gave him a second chance. In the midst of that second chance, a group of pagan sailors were, were saved. He goes to the city and 120,000 people hear this terrible message and they repent and lives are transformed. And the whole purpose of this book, I think, is to simply call to question Jonah's heart. And so I think that the purpose of us reading this book, and as much good truth is there in the, in the book, the real matter is, what is the condition of my heart? What's the condition of your heart? And, and so this morning, I just want to give us three thoughts that I believe Jonah is dealing with that's really at the heart of the matter. And I think there are issues that we in the faith continue to deal with and we have to find some solutions. The first is that of selfishness. Part of our human nature, I guess we could say. We want to do our own thing in our own time. We want things the way that we want things. We see it in the midst of his message. I, I mean, if you go back and read chapter 3, in cha um, yeah, chapter 3, here's Jonah's message. It's found in, in um, verse 4. This is what he preached going through the city. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He was so selfish, he didn't even want to tell them that there was hope for them because they were his enemy. He was selfish. He wanted to do his own thing. The second issue, I think there is an issue of bitterness. And I think that it's prevalent in the midst of our world, in the midst of our circles. We get upset and angry at the things that life deals us in such a way that we allow room for Satan to begin to grow the root of bitterness that brings destruction into the midst of our lives. And then thirdly, I think that there is a lack of love in Jonah's part. He didn't love the Ninevites. Thus he had no desire to see them change. And I sometimes wonder in the midst of, of our circles if we are lacking in love. It's, the Scripture says in the New Testament it's easy to love those who love us, but what about loving our enemies? And I believe that the, the heart of the matter, the, the, the intent of this book Jonah chapters 1 through 4 has to do with us looking at how we treat other people and what the matter of our heart is like. I don't think we have to think very long about how we speak of other people that we don't like. And I begin to wonder... Do we really want to see them changed or converted? The people that, are, that we would call pagan, in the midst of our circle, 
in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in, in my neighborhood, in, in my circles? Do I really love them the way that Christ loved them? So what do we do with this selfishness and what do we do with this bitterness and what do we do with this lack of love? Somehow we have to learn how to put to death our selfishness. We have to learn to, to come before our God and empty ourself before God. And I wish that I could say to you that it's an easy thing and that you only have to do it once. But from personal experience, in my own life and watching hundreds of people, I realize that, that putting self to death is a daily decision that we have to make. And if we don't do it, on a continual basis, somehow it resurrects. So what do we do with bitterness and anger in the midst of our lives? Somehow we have to learn how to forgive people who have wronged us, whether it be an individual or a group of people. We have to learn to extend forgiveness and somehow, we have to learn to love our enemies. It's not an option. It is not just something we can do whenever it feels good or we want to. It is a way of life. It is how Christ lived out his life over and over, day after day. It is the example that he has set before us that we learn to love our enemies. So we have to make the decision, you and I, that the matter of the heart is something that we allow our God to deal with on a daily basis and help us get to know. I like how it was said in Sunday school this morning in our class that it, you have to get to know the people. Your enemies, it's, it's much harder to hate those that you get to know. And so we, as the people of God, must learn to get to know one another, get to know those people that have hurt us. I, I've heard it said many times here recently about when someone has mistreats you at a restaurant or a, uh, at, a, at a checkout and they're ugly to you or they're responding, they've said over and over, there's probably something going on in the midst of their life that's causing them grief and heartache. And for us to, to grieve back to them or to bark back at them just makes matters worse. So what if when someone barks at us, what if somehow we begin to engage in a conversation with them to discover their story and learn somehow to love them in the way that Christ would love them? Maybe this morning, as you've listened to the story of Jonah and been reminded of the heart of the matter, maybe just maybe the Holy Spirit's at work here this morning in your heart. And he's kind of peeling back the curtain to look down deep into the midst of your journey. And maybe he's showing us some selfishness that we're dealing with. Or maybe there's some anger and bitterness that we're dealing with. Or maybe we just have a hate for people that the Holy Spirit wants to help us deal with today and get to the very core of our heart, the matter, that which matters. Yes, we've got to be missionaries. Yes, God gives us second chances. Yes, He calls us again and again but he wants to get to the very core of who we are and to help us to discover that the only way that we can become like him and love people 
and even love ourselves is when we learn to love Him with our whole heart. The song says, Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did He ever leave us on our own. And even when our heart's not functioning properly, and maybe it's been diseased by the world, the influences, He's still with us. And He wants to perform radical surgery on us to create in us a new heart, a clean heart, a pure heart, and walk with us each and every day. Father, well, I don't know if I was able to communicate uh, very well what you've communicated to my heart, but I do know that you are such an incredible God that you can take the words in between my mouth and our ears, you can do a redeeming work in us. And Lord, I don't want to be angry at the world, mad at you because you have done something. You've changed your mind. I just want to learn to love you and to love others in the world around me confident that you will never leave me, that you will walk with me, confident that you will take me and show me the areas in my life that need to be uh, reshaped, reformed, crucified, uh, just made like you. So Lord, tonight, today as we pray, as we sing this closing song, May our hearts be open to you and may we pour out our struggle before you today in Christ's name. I invite you to stand, sing with us as the praise team leads us in this song.
Well, this morning as we prepare um, to leave this place, just want to remind those of you that signed up for the Medicare luncheon that uh, that will take place immediately following the conclusion of the service. And if you have any questions about that, you can see Pastor Paul. The reminder today is that the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And the scripture reminds us that God knows how to take a stony heart and turn it into a heart of flesh that feels what he feels and responds to his message of hope and forgiveness. Go in his peace and with his power. Amen. Thank you for watching today online. It has been our privilege to share this time with you. I'm Pastor Terry Armstrong, and I want you to know that if we can do anything to assist you, any words that you would like to say, any comments that you would like to make, or anything that you would like to tell us about what God is doing in your life, please do not hesitate to give us a call. Our number is 405 376 2892, or you can email me directly at terry at mustangnaz.org. Again, we just hope that today your spirit, your heart has been encouraged by the presence of God. And so now I just want to say to you, may the peace of our Lord and Savior reign and rule, and may he give you his calmness in the midst of your storms. In Christ's name we pray these things for you. Amen and amen.